The Faith Inclusion Network welcomes you to this virtual presentation held May the 8th, 2020, presenting Jolene Philo, author and speaker of Different Dream Living. We are so, so happy to see you. So Jolene is actually a good, good friend of Finn. She has been to North uh, Virginia Beach for our conferences, I think four times. Is that right, Jolene? from Iowa. I remember once I introduced her from being from Idaho by accident, <laughs> but she's definitely from Iowa. Uh, and she's a writer and speaker and is in, a caregiver in, with, in lots of different ways, which I know she'll share some of her story with you. So we're so thrilled to have you, Jolene. And I'm really, really both, you know, for the people here and interested in myself personally and all the work you've been doing in research on how caregivers uh, have stress. Uh, we know everyone's having stress right now, but I think there's a certain, there's a difference there when you're already a caregiver and, and you know that there are definitely stressful times in that. And then you add another layer of a pandemic. I mean, it just is, you know, it's, it's a lot. So, I really thought you would be a perfect person to, to address that. And hopefully you all, whether you're a caregiver here or maybe you are uh, working or supporting caregivers in some uh, capacity or can share this information with them, um, I hope it'll be, we hope it'll be useful, helpful to you. So I'm gonna hand it, hand it over to Jolene. And at the end of this, we'll def after at the end of her presentation, we'll have definitely have time for questions and answers if you want to stay or you have time to stay. Um, and just so you know, this will be recorded, but we will not record the question and answer portion for um, so you can feel comfortable uh, sharing whatever you want to share. So here we go. Jolene, thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Karen, one of the as I look back, one of the happiest days of my life was when I received an email from this person named Karen Jackson, who said she had found my second book, which came out in like 2014, and it's called Different Dream Parenting. And she said she had found it and was leading a support group uh, or a study group with it. And from there, she then invited me to the a Finn conference and we've just become really good friends. And I just am, I'm so delighted to be able to be part of this and to talk to all of you parents and um, caregivers and people who support caregivers who signed up for a workshop on stress and compassion fatigue. And I think the fact that so many people signed up tells you something about this topic that it is important to caregivers and it's something that we're dealing with and maybe not sure how to handle. Um, so I became a caregiver um, when my father was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1959. He was 29, I was two. I wasn't much of a caregiver back then. But through my childhood, I have an older sister and a younger brother and through my childhood, dad lived in our home. His disease uh, went pretty rapidly at first. I can't remember him walking. So we all cared for dad in our home. He went into a nursing home in 1983 and he died there in 1997. When he went into the home, he was the youngest resident. And when he died, 20, all those years later, he was still the youngest resident and had been there the longest. So, you know, that gives you a bit of an idea of the breadth of that. Uh, my mother was a very determined woman and she went back to school. She was a teacher and she finished her four year degree. She got her master's degree. She cared for us. And she's now 91 and living in a memory care unit. Um, and so just yesterday I was over talking to her through her window, having a little visit. Uh, and the other piece of my caregiving journey was my son, who was born in 1982, and he was born, we didn't know uh, when he was born there was going to be anything wrong, but he was soon diagnosed with what's called tracheal esophageal atresia. That means his esophagus came down and formed a blind pouch, came up from his stomach and hooked into a tra his trachea. Uh, so he was life flighted about 750 miles away, had surgery at birth, and to make a long story short, by the time he was 
five. He'd had seven surgeries, many, many procedures. And he did very well, though he did um, end up at age 26 being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder caused by all that early surgery and those procedures. So um, I kind of got a long history of that. I also was a teacher and I had a special ed degree and I taught for 25 years. I left teaching in 2003 to start writing and speaking. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly, because, and the reason I'm doing this is because I remembered to lay these out so I would have them if anybody asked. So just in case you don't ask, I want you to know I was really prepared. So my first book um, is called A Different Dream for My Child. It's Devotions for Parents Raising Kids with Special Needs. It's not just my story, but I interviewed like 14 other families for it. And then the one I showed you a little bit ago came out after that. Um, I mentioned I have a book on post-traumatic stress disorder. It's called Does My Child Have PTSD? That came out in 2015. And it basically takes what the mental health care community already knows about childhood PTSD and explains it so that you and I as um, lay people can understand it. Um, and it is written completely for the general market. And I go into um, like schools and uh, I also teach certification classes for educators using this book. And then I co-authored with it, uh, Katie Weatherby, who is another mom of a child with special needs and a special ed teacher. She and I co-authored this one called Every Child Welcome, a ministry handbook for including every child at church. And that one's been really popular. And it's made so that whether you have a, a program, a, a real uh, official program in your church or not, you can minister to the kids with special needs that come into your church. And then finally, this last spring or last summer, um, this book came out, Sharing Love Abundantly in Special Needs Families, The Five Love Languages for Parents Raising Children with Special Needs, which I co-authored with, I still can't believe I get to say this, Dr. Gary Chapman, the love language guy. So, um, and, and again, for all of these books, with the exception of Every Child Welcome, I interviewed lots of parents who are caregivers, and it's their wisdom that I compile and, and share with parents. And so one thing that happened when in the olden days, when we could go to conferences and see people face to face, um, parents would talk to me about the stress that they were under and, and how tired they were. And so many of them would tell me about, it seemed like way out of proportion, the number of parents that were dealing with physical illnesses and, and mental health concerns. And looking back at my own experience, I recognized myself in some of what they were saying when I was an active caregiver. And I recognize my mother in her caregiving years and some of her behaviors and things that she dealt with. So I came back from one of those conferences in 2019 and I thought, you know, I think there's maybe a book in this and I don't think anybody really has dealt with stress in caregivers, especially caregiving parents who are caring for children with special needs. It's like a topic nobody wants to talk about because we don't want to say our kids stress us out and that, you know, they're affecting our health. What good parent would say that? Even though it's true and they're dealing with lots of stress, nobody wants to be the one that says, yeah, that's me. So I made a little survey and put it up on my website, which is called differentdream.com. And it's a website for parents raising kids with special needs. Um, and I, I did this survey in January of 2019, like maybe January 3rd, I put it up. And within a month, 1,400 people had completed the survey and I had to shut it off because I'm one person. I couldn't deal with that much any more data and people were just filling it out and they were sharing it. And I was like, Oh yeah, I really do think this is an issue. So the first, and I'm going to share some of the results of that survey with you. And I also wanted to let you know that as a result of that survey, I have started working on, or I, have a book proposal that my agent is now pitching about um, stress and compassion fatigue and caregiving parents. So it's she just sent it out this week to three <laughs> to three um, publishers, and two of them already 
let her know right away that they were excited to look at it. That doesn't mean I'll get a contract, but I will be surprised if somebody doesn't pick this up, especially with the environment we're in now, where everybody's experienced at least experiencing that level of stress in some way. And it's double, like Karen said, for caregiving parents. So I'm gonna pose to you a few of the questions that were on the survey and Michelle is gonna put those up. And the first question is going up now. And the first two questions are going up now and they are, has caregiving stress affected your mental health? Yes or no? Has it affected your physical health? Yes or no? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to fill that out. And then we're gonna compare that to the results. So the, this survey that I mentioned that I did on my website in 2019, I had parents from, get this list of places fixed in your brain, all over the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Ireland, Italy, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, and South Africa. Filled it out. So, you know, and, and I, if I could have translated it into another language, who knows how many more people would have filled it out. So here's a, a little bit about what I found out. 98% of the people who filled it out said that um, caregiving duties cause stress in their lives. 91% said it had affected their mental health. 91%. And 87% said it had affected their physical health. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Uh, and so I'm looking here at the results of what you said for physical health. Right now it's up to 68% say that it affected their physical health. And I know you had the mental health one up. Michelle, what was the number on that one? It actually proved, hang on. Okay, all right. Well, just when you get it, go ahead and let me know. So that just like, disturbed me that so many people were having their mental and physical health affected by caregiving. And so one of the other questions I asked were what were the major causes of stress in your life? <coughs> and um, these, and I had forced choices on that. So I had a list of what, what I thought and, and the things that I listed were again, from my own personal experience, what I experienced when I was caring for our son, what I saw my mother experience, and also then what um, people told me about when I go to conferences and talk to caregiving parents. So for the mental health survey, 87% of you said that stress has affected your mental health. And I think the last thing I saw on the physical health, now it's up to 72%. So maybe not quite as high as the people who filled out the original survey, but still really high. So you're gonna answer the same question. This is our third question. Which of these is a major cause of stress for you? And here's what I have, overwhelming demands, isolation, and you're gonna just, just pick one. It's a forced choice. Isolation, financial constraints, lack of emotional support, lack of available resources, lack of practical support, grief, other, or do we have all of the above on this one? Okay. And a lot of people, when they did the survey on my website, put in other, and their answer for other was, we want to choose more than one of these, or we want to choose all of these, because they're all true. So while you're filling that out, I'm going to read through the, uh, the results of the survey um, from greatest number to least. Number one was overwhelming demands at 25%, isolation at 20%, financial constraints at 12%, lack of emotional support 10%, lack of available resources 9%, lack of practical support 9%, grief 3%, and other 11%. And in a little bit, I'll go over. No, I don't think I do. Sorry about that. Um, so on, on the survey that you are completing, 
we have again overwhelming demands for you it's 38 percent as opposed to 25 percent on the survey uh, the second one we have a tie between isolation and lack of practical support at eight um, percent then we have other grief and lack of available resources at four percent for the people who are in on this our zoom meeting today so in addition to that question, which was, which of these are the major causes of stress in your life? Another, excuse me, that question was, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, which of these is a major cause of stress for you? Then I asked this question with some other things. Which of these is the most frequent stressor in your life? And these are different from what you answered before. Sleep deprivation, excessive paperwork, insurance coverage issues, government program issues. So for us, that would be like waiver programs and Medicare and Medicaid, that kind of thing. Spiritual doubts and questions, unreliable hired caregivers, other or all of the above. All right. Oh, this is funny. You get, when, when we get yours, um, when we see what yours is, because it's hmm, interesting. Sleep deprivation on the survey on my website. 77%. Excessive paperwork, 44%. Insurance coverage issues, 39%. Government program issues, 37%. Spiritual doubts and questions, 30%. Unreliable caregivers, hired caregivers, 27%, and other, 26%. And on this one, people could choose more than one which is why that adds up to way more than 100%. So here's what you are saying. Sleep deprivation, again, is the highest, and it's 27%. And that ties with other, which is 27%. Um, next is excessive paperwork, 18%. Spiritual doubts and questions, 9%. Same for unreliable hired caregivers, 9%. All of the above, 9%. So um, I, what I found really interesting when I did the, um, when I did the survey for, um, on my website was how many people found the very things that are supposed to help them, insurance, government programs, the caregivers, the paperwork you fill out for all of those things, the things that were supposed to be help, helping them were their greatest causes of stress in their life. And that's, that's something, that's wrong. You know, something's wrong there with our system when that's the case. And by a show of hands, how many of you find that to be a real issue and a source of frustration? It's huge. If you're dealing with those things, it, it's huge. You know, my mother, um, is 91 and I am her power of attorney and she gets this little tiny pension $218 a month from the civil service because my dad was in the civil service but not very long so um, I get this form I have to fill out about every year about how I spend that $218 a month on her behalf now I understand it's there because they want us not have fraud in this system. But it's like, really, $218? And I need to fill out an eight-page form for that? Could you simplify that? <laughs> no. And I'm sure you all deal with much more than that. OK, so now I want to look at what people said in the comments section about how they were, their mental health was affected by um, the stress they deal with. And, and this is a lot of numbers, so just, just kind of look at it um, broadly. Don't think that you need to know all the details. So these were, again, remember, almost 1,500 people. 545 said they're depressed the majority of the time. That's a third. 25 others said they're sad. 13 said they cry uncontrollably. Both of those are symptoms of depression. 777 
said they suffer from anxiety. 35 have panic attacks. 25 said, say they're overly fearful. 73 said they worried excessively and 39 said worry keeps them awake at night. So when you put all that together, which are all just different ways of saying you're anxious, you're getting close to two thirds of the caregivers that filled out the survey. Only 92 of those people said they take medication for anxiety or depression. Many said they visit therapists. Many more said they need a therapist, but their caregiving duties don't allow for it. Yeah. 130 said they have post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of caregiving. And 239 say they are exhausted, drained, tired, or deal with constant fatigue. All of that is, again, another symptom of depression. Okay, so effects on your physical health. So, because that was just mental health. 135 said they have back problems or back pain caused by caregiving duties. 145 others said they deal with some other kind of pain. 66 mentioned headaches, 39 mentioned severe migraines. And I think the other thing we have to remember is these are the people who are caring for children with special needs. They're the primary caregivers. And while they're caring, they're dealing with all these own issues, these issues related to their physical and mental health. 56 parents said they are sluggish. 45 said they can't focus. They have foggy thinking or forgetful or are forgetful because of lack of sleep. Again, those are, if you look at the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual for Mental Illnesses, those are all symptoms of depression. 112 said they had developed high blood pressure. Get this, 20 said they had had strokes recently. And not all of them were very old. You know, they were in their 40s or 50s maybe. Uh, 38 had developed diabetes or prediabetes. 37 mentioned heartburn, stomach pro problems, bad digestion, and thyroid issues. This one really surprised me, but it shouldn't. 50 said they had, and these were mostly women, 50 said they had experienced hair loss and skin problems. 25 said their autoimmune systems were failing. Many others also mentioned specific autoimmune diseases like lupus, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and multiple sclerosis. And several mentioned premature aging or being diagnosed with physical conditions usually associated with older people. Are you depressed yourself now? Like <laughs> That's like such a dump. But yeah, and you know, I read through these all these pages of the survey results. And I was just crying thinking about those parents and, and none of us, no one so far has really just said, Hey, this is an issue. Let's deal with it. And, and it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with you as a parent because you're having these symptoms. What's wrong is the stress you're dealing with. And we've just got to do something about that. So why do we need to deal with stress? Why is it so important? Um, well, it's because we are caregivers for our kids and they need us to be healthy. And mo many of us as caregivers are gonna be caring for our children as long as we're alive or we hope to be. And so we need to be as healthy mentally and physically as possible to care for our kids. We also need to do it for ourselves because you know we as caregivers want to be on the top of our game, but we also want to be able to live lives where we can enjoy our time and, and find ways to live a good and rich life as caregivers. And that is definitely possible. I've seen it happen with many, many parents, but we need to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, the, also, the snowball effect, I think, makes this really important because if, if people, caregivers don't deal with their stress and the effects of stress mentally and physically when they first begin, they're just going to get worse and worse and worse. It's gonna grow. And then there's also the issue of generational stress. Um, research shows 
that uh, there's a gen genetic marker for post-traumatic stress disorder that can be passed down from parents who have, <coughs> excuse me, who have PTSD. <coughs> I, I'm sorry, I took a um, bouquet of lilacs to my mother yesterday and I should have put them in the trunk because I um, am allergic to them and I didn't think about that. So that's where this cough is coming from. I don't have COVID. So um, we really need to start dealing with our stress because especially for young parents, if they start having PTSD and then they have more children, that stress marker can be passed on to more children in the family. So we really need to be paying attention to that. So the rest of our time now is going to be talking about some stress management strategies that are simple, practical, inexpensive and doable that parents can implement to at least start lowering their stress. And I'm really excited if this book ever gets um, published. For the book proposal, I interviewed 16 of the parents who filled out this survey and I chose 16 parents who said they have found positive ways to cope with their stress because those are the parents we can learn from. And what they had to tell me was just amazing. I wasn't able to get a lot of that collated into this presentation, but I, I, if I get a contract, I'm gonna interview even more parents. And I think what they have to say about how they as caregivers have learned to deal with their stress and cope with it and stay healthy is gonna be amazing. So these are just 10 ideas to start with. And the first one is, you need to seek help. Caregivers are very reluctant to ask anybody to help them. They're reluctant to, um, <clears throat> and sometimes it's a pride issue, they don't want to admit it. Sometimes it's a fear issue. Uh, I just was involved in a Facebook discussion where someone said, uh, a mother had contacted her, wants to get mental health therapy, but she's afraid if she does, her children will be taken away from her. So there's that fear issue. And a psychiatrist who works with a lot of these families left a comment and said, I have never in all my years of practice seen a child taken away from a, a parent who actively sought mental health care therapy because that's a positive step, right? and they were able to work through it. But fear can be a big issue. Um, and I saw my mother when we were growing up, she was bound and determined to take care of dad and do everything on her own. And the only people she would ask to help her with that were family members, which meant three young children of whom I was one and an aunt and uncle who lived in town. She would ask us for help. And sometimes to be honest, what she asked for was way out of line. It was beyond what little children should be doing. And it was more than my aunt and uncle who had their whole own family could be doing. But that's, those were the only people mom would ask for help. Uh, and, and what I tell parents all the time is, and, and this I'm speaking from my own, um, my own experience, you know, when my son was little and really, really sick, I just was like, I just want to find the person who can fix this and make it better. I need to find that doctor or that therapist who can make things better and is gonna fix everything. And I wasn't taking ownership of, of any of it myself. And the truth is nobody's gonna swoop in and just make everything all better. The only way we were able to make things better for our son was by becoming his advocates and being proactive and insisting. So, you have to ask for help. You have to ask those questions. You have to admit you need help. One, um, and some, there are organizations who can be very helpful. Some of those are um, government programs, even though the paperwork is terrible. Schools, if you can get in a good school system and get people who are going to work with you on IEPs to help your kids. Uh, medical facilities can be very helpful. Uh, I often tell um, parents who ask me, where can I access services? You know, they may, I'm in Iowa, they may be from California. And one of the things I tell them is call your, the closest children's hospital to where you live or the closest university hospital to where you live 
and get a hold of the social workers and ask the social workers if they can recommend any resources to you. And I got to that answer because my husband used to be an intensive care nurse. And he said, you know, before somebody was dismissed from intensive care, they had to have a visit with a social worker about setting up aftercare. And he said, those social workers in the hospital know the people to talk to. So I recommend that all the time. That's at least a place to start. I would also say, um, I would add to that if you're dealing with children, get a hold of the child life specialist department in your in a hospital near you and see what they can point you to. Um, Easter Seals is a great facility. When we were kids, we would go out to eat once a month. And um, one day we were at the Hammers restaurant one evening and this man came over us and to us and introduced himself to our family. And my dad was in a wheelchair. And he, his name was Norm Jensen. And he asked my parents, are you getting any services from Easter Seals? Well, my mother wouldn't ask for help from anybody, so no, we weren't. He was very insistent. And within a few months, he had arranged for a Hoyer lift for my dad to get him in and out of bed and a hospital bed free of charge. And he signed dad up for Easter Seals and started getting him books from the Federation for the Blind, which you could get, you got records back then. It was a very old fashioned system, but, and he could get magazines and all sorts of stuff. Easter Seals is a great place to start and they also can refer you to other organizations. Um, sometimes service clubs in your town are willing to help people um, with disabilities. And of course, ask your church. Uh, the people who you might get a hold of are teachers Usually teachers can tell you, uh, point you in the right direction, and so can school counselors, if you've got a good school counselor. I already mentioned hospitals, social workers, neighbors, sometimes friends, church family, and extended family. Ask them, and, and ask them also, some of them, if, they, if you can train them to come in and help with your child. Help them get to know your child well enough to sit with them for maybe an hour so you can go somewhere. Okay, that's the first item of the 10. And we're gonna do a poll question here um, that's gonna go on, go along with the second item on my list. And your question is, do you have someone you can talk to when you feel stressed? Yes or no? And that's the item. You need to talk to someone. You gotta find somebody. Uh, and when you talk to someone, you're gonna discover that you're not alone in this. If it's another caregiving parent, you're gonna discover you, they have the same feelings you do and they're dealing with some of the same issues. If it's, if it's a friend, they may be able to look at something more objectively and help you see that things aren't as bad as you think they are or they're worse than you think they are and insist that you get some more help. Okay, you have filled it out and 96% of you say yes, you have someone you can talk to, and 4% say no. Who could that person be? It could be um, a friend, neighbor, family member, whoever, or a support group. You know, I was in my 50s before somebody told me that there was a Facebook support group for parents of kids with my son's disability. I had gone over 50 years without talking to somebody who knew exactly what we were going through. And you know, like my son's out on his own now and he's doing just fine, but I still really like going into those groups and being able to say to those parents, you know, this isn't gonna be forever. Things will change, your child will mature, there are gonna be new, new uh, breakthroughs in medicine, hang in there, you can do it, I know it's hard now. So it's really important to hear those voices. Um, I had a friend whose um, wife, he's a friend of mine from high school, last spring his wife who deals with, I think she's, I think it's schizophrenia, her medication, uh, they weren't able to get it and she went into a tailspin. And for a number of months, he wasn't able to see her very much and it, it was just really hard. And you know what he did? He created a private Facebook group where he could post updates on how his wife was doing. And he invited friends to join if they wanted. And then he could post those updates 
and post prayer requests. And we could just encourage him. And I thought, what a lovely idea. And if we're having a hard time, we can do that too. And we can be, and a lot of his prayers were pray for my wife. And we could be doing that, pray for my child. Here's what they need. Here's what I want. Um, another thing about talking to someone, you have to be transparent. You can't try and make yourself sound like you're in better shape than you are. Tell the truth. Uh, if you're the person that's the friend, or if you're the one who needs somebody to talk to, you also have to make sure that sometimes you listen and you ask questions of them because friendships need to be reciprocal. And then my last bit of advice on talking to someone is avoid toxic people or toxic groups. If you get into a face-to-face -face or a virtual group where everything's negative, all people do is complain, they just make things worse. Get out of that group. You don't need that. You've got enough going on in your life. You need to make sure that you're dealing with people who are positive, who are going to speak truth into your life and help you find solutions, not wallow in problems. That gets you nowhere. Okay, here's our next question. Do your caregiving duties keep you from consulting with a therapist or doctor about your mental and or physical health concerns? And then it's a yes or no. So this is the next item in our, in our list. You need to tend to your health. Uh, I know this sounds like one more thing to do and you're already really busy if you're a caregiver, but there are simple ways to tend to your health. The first one is to watch your diet. Um, and <laughs> this is so appropriate for us right now. Instead of going out to eat, you need to be cooking at home more because that's healthier food. Um, and that can be hard, especially if you're not much of a cook. Uh, but one thing that really helped me and lowered my stress so much when I finally figured this out was meal planning. Because I was working when our kids were little and I would be sitting at school thinking, I have no idea what we're going to eat for supper tonight. And especially when our son was really little, we lived in a town of 92 people. There was one cafe, and this was in 1983, so it was mostly French fries and cheeseburgers. You can only eat that so many times. So I would be sitting at work thinking, what am I going to fix for supper tonight? I have no idea. And when I figured out meal planning and started having meals in the freezer, that made life so much simpler. Uh, there is a website called, maybe you've heard of it. Have you ever heard of the Lazy Genius? She has the best tagline in the world. It is, be a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. I mean, I wish I'd thought of that. She's got a book coming up this summer, and you can find her online at the lazygeniuscollective.com. And she has a lot of posts there. She's got a podcast and, and a blog, and she's got a lot of posts about meal planning. And I would really encourage you to go there if, if that's a struggle for you, because she can really help you get on that train of, of how to make meals easy and yet healthy. Um, buy a lot of fresh produce, avoid carry out. <laughs> I wrote this obviously before COVID. Avoid carry out and drive up. <laughs> So the Lazy Genius Collective we talked about. Um, I also have a friend named Ivana, E-V-A-N-A, -A, Sandusky, S-A-N-D-U-S-K-Y. And she has a blog. I'm sorry, I don't have the blog address with me, but I think if you just Google her, you'll find it. She has a daughter who has Down syndrome and really a lot of health issues, you know, the heart and the breathing issues that can go along with Down syndrome. And her daughter is about 10 or 12. And Ivana um, became pretty um, overweight dealing with her daughter, who ends up being hospitalized two or three times a year. And she decided a year or two ago that she was going to do something about her weight. And I, I think she started um, kind of a keto diet and has stuck with it. And she has lost like 60 or 80 pounds while actively caregiving and during a number of hospital stays with her daughter. And she has some posts about how she did that. So, and I give her as an example of someone that's, yes, you, you can find a way to improve your health. 
and you can feel better and you can watch your diet. Um, exercise is another thing to make sure you're getting more exercise. So walk uh, with a stroller, take your kids outside for walks. If you can do an online exercise video, find a video for your kids and do it with them. An exercise video for your kids, take the stairs when you can, park further away, get a treadmill. Yuck, I could never do that. I would be a basket case in five minutes if I had to do that, but some people like it. Uh, get more sleep. That's another thing to tend to your health. Um, and I have talked to a number of parents who have figured out a way to do that. And what many of them have done is um, they, they take turns. And one of them gets to sleep through the night one night, and the other parent gets to sleep through the night the next night. And then and the other one gets up with the child who has health issues. Um, if that's hard for you, get earplugs so that on your night when you're supposed to sleep, you put the earplugs in, you can't hear everything. Um, because I was great for that, for hearing everything that was going on and when my husband agreed to watch our son, and then I didn't sleep at night anyway. Um, other people, like every other Saturday, one of them gets to sleep in, and, and the other one watches the kids, so at least you can catch up on some sleep that way. Um, I've had parents tell me that they get an, uh, somebody to come into their house one or two afternoons a week to watch the kids and they just go sleep. Anything you can do. Uh, swap time with other parents. Maybe you take their kids one day, their kids, and it goes the other way another day, and then you sleep during that time. I know we can't do it right now with all the shutdowns, but someday we'll be able to do that again. And then if you can, uh, not even if you think you can, um, but unless there's absolutely no way, uh, see your doctor and or make an appointment with a therapist. And if you aren't sure how to find a good mental health care therapist, on my website, differentdream.com, I have a post about that. So you can go to my website, differentdream.com, and just type in the search bar, how to find a therapist. And it'll outline for you how to find a therapist wherever you live in the United States. So for the poll question, do your caregiving duties keep you from consulting with a doctor or therapist? 26% of you said yes, 74% said no. So that's good, but I am concerned about that 26% who can't uh, get away to, to deal, talk to a professional about their own health, or their own health, excuse me. Here's the next thing. We're gonna go on to another one. Uh, poll number seven, poll question seven is, do you ever feel guilty about making time and space for yourself each day? Yes or no? Uh, why do we need to make time and space for ourselves? Because it's a way to keep sane. So here are some ideas on how to make time. Um, engage in a hobby. Figure out something that you can do, not just watching television and binging on Netflix, but what's a hobby that you could really find that would help you think about something else a little. One woman from Australia who filled out this survey, who's been a caregiver for a long time, she said, I crochet and I knit because it keeps my hands and my mind busy. So it can be just something. And then you're feeling like you're accomplishing something too. You've got something at the end of it that you made that you could give to somebody or use, and that's really important. Um, use technology and use it to save time, not to waste it. So here are some ways to use technology um, uh, that, that kind of double up on your time use. Uh, watch some funny shows now and then. I like to watch some shows while I cook. It just makes the time go faster for me if I can watch something. Um, Listen to podcasts and audiobooks while you're doing house and yard work. Uh, when I can listen to an audiobook, someone is telling me a story, and if I'm cleaning the bathroom, I want to keep cleaning the bathroom because I want to keep listening to the story, and so my bathroom is much cleaner than it would normally be. So if you can marry something that's really enjoyable to you to something that's not, you can make that more bearable. Uh, there are Bible read-aloud apps. So if you like, if you aren't getting um, like Bible reading time in, use an app and listen while you're doing something, just even while you're getting ready in the morning. Um, set alarms 
so you remember things, set alarms on your phone so that you're make, you make sure to get up and do something, move around at this time or whatever. Um, use some schedules. There's lots of good scheduling things. My daughter really likes an, an app called Todoist. So it's T-O-D-O-I-S-T. And she can set, she can list out what she needs to do for her work each day because she works from home and she's a young mom and what she wants to do personally each day. And then it'll give her little prompts to get them done and then she can mark them off and they disappear. And that just really helps her. So some of those kinds of apps. Um, and then figuring out a schedule that's gonna work for you. Other things to make time for yourself, practice meditation, prayer, and deep breathing. There are studies that show this lowers your heart rate and stress level. Sip tea and read a good book. That's a way to make time. And here is my all-time favorite from a mom friend of mine who has five children, all of them biological children. All five had some kind of special need or another. Her oldest boy died of a brain tumor, and she has a couple with um, autism and three with autism and one with ADHD. And when all of her kids were really little <clears throat> and life was crazy, she only used paper plates. She cooked at home, but she always used paper plates so that she didn't have to do dishes. You know, you do what you got to do and that's okay. So how to make space where you live and so that you have space for yourself. First of all, simplify and um, just, just make things easier for yourself. Here's an example. We live intergenerationally with my daughter and her husband and their two children who are five and two. When the two-year-old was one and began to walk, well, not even one, so she was like 11 months, and she walked and climbed on everything, including this really nice um, end table I had made of suitcases, and then it had a lamp on it made of a flute. And she would climb those suitcases and tap the buttons on the flute all the time, and it was always falling over. We finally just had to move it, get rid of all that until she's done climbing, which she's still not done. But it wasn't worth stressing out over. So just get rid of things that are causing problems. Put them away until you can have them out again. Um, declutter. We moved three years ago from a big old farmhouse with an attic that we had been stuffing full for 30 years. And I had to declutter because the house we're in now is much smaller. And it is so free. I don't have all this stuff to think about. I don't have all this dusting to do. I don't have to wonder where it is. So declutter and get rid of what you can. And then designate a space for yourself. It doesn't have to be much. It can be the bathroom with the door shut and locked if you need to, but make yourself a space. Or it could be a chair by the window where you have a candle that you light when you drink your tea or something, or a little spot in your bedroom, whatever. But make a space for you where you can just go and kind of now and then. So for all of you in on this question about, do you ever feel guilty about making time and space for yourself each day? 63% said yes. You feel guilty. And 38% said no. This is not something you should feel guilty about because a little time, even if it's only five minutes for you a day, that is gonna lower your stress level considerably because you have that to look forward to. Okay, here's another way to combat stress. Go outside. Now I know that we're in the middle of a shutdown and going outside isn't as easy, but you can get outside. If you have a deck, you could sit out there. Um, you, can, you can make that space I just talked about, make it an outdoor space on the deck where you go and sit. Um, you could garden. My mom loved to garden. She couldn't get away because dad needed a lot of care, but she would go out and vegetable garden and work in her flower garden. And she just loved it. That was a big stress reliever for her. Take a walk. If you can have coffee on the porch. Uh, one person told me in my survey, she said, I go out and milk the goats. They lived on a farm. And she said, I have to get out. The goats have to be milked and it just gets me away for a little bit. So figure out your own goat milking thing, whatever that's gonna be for you. Something that always gets you outside for a little bit. Or if you can't get outside for some reason, especially in this season, 
where it might be harder if you're an apartment dweller, open a window and sit beside it and just get some fresh air. So here's my next question for you. Which of these is your greatest caregiving fear about the future? I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. I'll die before my child does, or my child will die before I do. Because the next item on lowering stress is that you need to face your fear. You need to face what it is that worries you the most. And we all have those fears if we're caregiving parents. We all have them even if we're not caregivers, but if we're caregiving parents, these are the three most common fears that people voice to me that they say is their problem. I'll be doing this forever. And I know it feels like that. I know there was a time my mom cared for my dad for 38 years. And I know sometimes it felt like forever for her. And sometimes it felt like forever for me, you know, and my family when we would go back to see my parents. Is, is dad's going to be in this nursing home forever. But it, that isn't true. That's a lie. At some point, probably in this life, but most surely in the next, you will not be a caregiver anymore. So if you're feeling that way, remind yourself that that is not true. You will not be caregiving forever. There will be a time when the person you're caring for, if they're a believer, is fully restored and fully healed. And you will have a wonderful relationship with them for eternity. Second, I'll die before my child does. Now that's a valid fear. That's a valid fear. It really is. Um, so how do we combat that fear? We prepare for that when that's going to happen. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. And then the other fear is my child will die before I do. And that was a real fear for me. And I really didn't, it, for about eight months when our son was really sick, a newborn, I worried about that constantly until, you know, God kind of shook me by the shoulder one day when I was like really overwhelmed and threw this glass, the plastic glass against the wall in my anxiety and it shattered, a plastic glass shattered. That's how hard I threw it. And it was like, God just said, Jolene, what are you worrying about? And I was like, well, my baby could die. And he said, well, what do you know about me? And I was like, well, you love children. You sent Jesus. And he was like, well, then what's going to happen to your son if, you, if he dies? Well, he'll be with you. And it was kind of, hmm, then really, what am I worrying about? You know, I'll see him again someday. He'll be recovered. And I will not have to go through puberty with him. And to show you that God has a very good sense of humor, our son had one of the worst puberties on record. Raising him through puberty was not fun. So, you know, one way or the other, there, we're going to have fears, but that one we can face, and we can face it with assurance. Now, here's what you said. I'll be doing this the rest of my life, 35%. That's your fear. I'll die before my child does, 55% of you. And my child will die before I do, 10%. So those are where our fears are laying out here. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk in just a minute about the one that most of you mentioned, I'll die before my child does. But first, I have one other stress reliever I want to pass along. And that is that one way to combat these fears is to live in the now. Live in the day you're in and quit worrying so much about the future. Uh, one of the women I interviewed for my first book has a daughter who is very, she's a, has cerebral palsy, um, the mental ability of a five-year-old or no, a five-month-old, very, very um, compromised health and very fragile. And her parents have been caring for her now. She's almost 40. Lacey is almost 40. And what her mother Peggy told me was that, you know, when, when Lacey was five, I would worry about, well, what am I going to do when she's 13 and starts like menstruating? How am I going to handle that? Or when she was 15, 
what am I going to do when Lacey is an adult or we're, we're old and who's going to take care of her? And she finally had to realize, you know, that when she had those thoughts, she was missing out on who Lacey was at five. And she wasn't enjoying Lacey at five. And when she worried when Lacey was 15, she was missing out on Lacey at 15. And she trained her mind to start staying in the day and it, appreciating what she had with Lacey each day. And that really lowered her fears. So I would encourage that. That's a real good stress reliever. Now, another one is, and this is the one that goes along, uh, or here's a poll question before we go on to this one that may answer your question or answer your concerns, I should say, about um, the future for your child. Here's the question. Are you preparing for your child's transition to adulthood? And there's three choices. Yes, no, and my child is already an adult. So if you got to prepare for the future for your child, because you may not be there for your child's whole life, and you want to make sure they have a good, rich life, uh, you can start that when your child is in high school. Um, and if they're in the public school system and have an IEP, transitional planning should be part of the IEP. And that needs to start when a child is 15, at least by 15. So if it hasn't, you need to advocate at IEP meetings and insist on getting some transitional planning in there. Another thing to do is to look at special needs trusts. If you haven't prepared a special needs trust for your child who is underage, get started on that now. The requirements are different for every state. So you want to find a lawyer in your state. And if you just Google in um, special needs trust attorneys by state, you will probably get some up or you will also get a website that helps locate them. And I can't remember what the name of that website is. Um, but in this book, Different Dream Parenting, there is an entire chapter on starting a special needs trust and what the steps are for that and what's involved. Um, and there are a lot more websites out there and a lot more blog posts about that now than there used to be. There are ABLE accounts. The ABLE Act was passed a few years ago um, and that allows you to save money for your child so that they have money um, when you're gone. Um, there's also guardianship issues you need to be checking into. And then one thing you can start doing is just get your papers organized so you know where everything is and then get somebody else in, a sibling of your child or someone you trust and show them where all the paperwork is so that if anything would happen to you, they know where all your paperwork about your child's future is located and they can go and pick up and help make sure your child has everything he or she needs. And then you need to review that annually to make sure you've added anything new or if there's been changes made and then get together with that person you trust and go over it with them again, any changes and remind them where they can find everything and who to call so that your child with special needs has the support they need when they need it. And once you've done that, your fear about if you would die before your child does will be much lowered, which means your stress will be lowered. You just have to do that for your sake and for your child's sake. And then the final thing that I think as believers, we really need to remember to lower our stress is just to run to Jesus. Oh, and by the way, for the transition to adulthood question, 32% of you said, yes, you're working on that, hooray. 21% said no, and I hope this gives you some ideas of where to start. And 47 of you have children who are already adults. So, uh, and if you haven't done anything for your child who is an adult, I would still consult with a special needs lawyer and see if you can get anything in place now. So back to that last item, um, run to Jesus. There are, there are studies that show, I mentioned this before, um, that meditation and prayer can lower stress. There are also studies that show people with a strong faith have lower stress than people who don't. Um, and that was also evidenced by the people in my survey. Those who had a strong faith rated their stress levels much lower. Uh, and then keep an eternal perspective. We talked about that already too. You won't be doing this for eternity. It seems like eternity now. 
but you won't be a caregiver for eternity. So kind of take a step back and remind yourself of that, that this is only for a season. Um, and cling to the hope of full restoration, that one day your loved one and you will be fully restored, you'll be in the presence of Jesus, and what you have learned and done in this earth, on this earth will, will make your relationship with Jesus in heaven that much stronger and richer, and your, your, your uh, joy in being with him and being restored that much greater. And then just remember that God knows about your struggles and he cares about you. And more than that, he is pleased with what you are doing. I always get teary in this part. You know, caregivers are doing holy work every day. And you need to remember that. And if you are doing holy work and you're being the hands and feet of Jesus, when you come before him, He's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that will be the best thing next to being saved that you will ever hear. So with that, Karen knows me well enough to know that I always have to cry at some point. Um, I am ready for your questions, I think. Yeah. All right. Everybody quit crying. Get your Kleenex. Let's, it's my, it's my like Oprah moment. It's okay. Except you are not going to look under your chairs and find a key for a new vehicle. Darn I, don't, it. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joanne. You're welcome. Our Q&A time was not recorded to protect privacy concerns. We hope you will join us next time. For more information about the Faith Inclusion Network, visit us online at www.faithinclusionnetwork.com dot org.